And welcome, folks, to another Great Deception podcast. Tonight, we have a special event for you because I don't, you know, I don't do many interviews, so to speak. So we got a great conversation tonight. Um, I had the pleasure of of coming across this guy on, uh, he, he was a listener of the show and is someone who's going to blow your minds tonight with a massive amount of information. We just talked the other night on, uh, had a great talk on the patron only talk on Friday night and he's uh, coming back for more and you guys are in for a treat. So I want to welcome Matthew Smith. He is a architect, a roundhouse engineer, a, a master engineer at that. I love uh, hearing his stories of his work and how he got into it. And that's a whole nother podcast in itself. So we won't go too deep into that. But uh, Matthew, welcome to the show. How are you? I'm wonderful, Matt. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much for extending the invitation. Oh, uh, when when you 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 know, I think it was about two lines into your email to me, you had me hooked. Once you started saying old world architecture, <laughs> and then you started mentioning old world concrete and cement and and like <clears throat> anybody that knows me, and then then you said the the magic word. As soon as you mentioned Chicago World Fair, I don't mm. care what you say around it, I'm in. I'm all mm. in. That's like my uh the the holy grail to me i've been chasing that thing since i got into this so uh yeah you you just blew my mind and i, I can't wait to hear what you have uh to show us tonight right on well where do you want to start uh i don't know well let's tell a little bit about what how you got into this mm -hmm. I, i'm always interested to see how people got into you know um a you know, just your personal interest in architecture and how you got into it and then how it kind of translated into this old world stuff. Right. Well, I mean, it's a very long story. I mean, I, you know, won't get into all of it, um, but, you know, I've been interested in designing and really started out fixing up houses when I was a kid, grew up in a, an old house in the East Coast, in New Jersey. And, you know, it was always falling down around us. We had a big family. Things were getting broken. Plaster and lath would crumble. And so just from when I, you know, really since I was a little kid, I was fixing up houses and looking at materials and looking at, you know, the difference between plaster and lath on old, you know, true two by four dug fur studs, you know, and, and, and going to the hardware store and lumber yard and coming back with you know studs that were one and a half by three and a half made out of white spruce and pine and super soft and like putting drywall where there was plaster and lath so it's like you know and that was when I was you know a young teenager and uh so just looking at the material the materiality of of structures um yeah it goes back pretty far and I always knew I think I always knew I wanted to be an architect I knew I, you know, I wanted to work on houses and yeah, I studied architecture. I spent six years, um, you know, in formal education at the university level. I got my degree from the New Jersey Institute of Technology in Newark, which is a city filled with history. It's 350 years of, you know, waves of immigration and different um, cultures that arrived and left their mark and, and it's a yeah, stone's but, throw from New York City, right? You're just across the river. Right across the river. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we can see the New York City skyline, you know, basically from the roof of my architecture building. Uh, so, yeah, I grew up under, you know, in the shadow of New York City, pretty much. And, uh, you know, so you know, I've been looking at buildings for a very long time, but it wasn't until recent years that I've just started looking at them through a new lens. And um, <clears throat> it also so happens that um, my uh, my family from my mother's side is um, rooted in Chicago. Oh, wow. And I have an uncle who's a Chicago historian. I've got a few of his books behind me. And when I was um, when I was 20, I quit college. That was back in uh, two, uh, nine, <laughs> 2000, 1994. <laughs> I quit college. I was I was studying at the University of Virginia at that time, and I spent a year uh, driving around the country on a motorcycle. 
And um, so I had like an amazing adventure. I wanted to study architecture on the road and I ended up at some really cool places like uh, California Institute of Earth Art and Architecture in the Mojave Desert, Southern California. And there, there's an Iranian architect who's building um, Adobe uh, sandbag uh, domes and vaults, um, just making structures out of the ground, beautiful earth and you know, organic structures, literally out of the ground. And um, so I was captivated uh, by, you know, more organic approach, you know, vernacular architecture from, from, from early on. But on that trip, I spent some months in Chicago. Um, I did some roofing with one uncle. Um, on my mother's side, it was, you know, contractors up and down. So, you know, a lot of roofing contractors. So I, I cut my teeth, you know, in the construction uh, trades working for my uncle. This other uncle, however, um, He's a Chicago historian. He used to own a, a bookstore called Chicago Bookworks in Evanston. Um, um, and um, I spent time with him and he took me around and he, he, he's the one that first turned me on to, like really turned me on to Frank Lloyd Wright and Louis Sullivan and you know taught me about the Prairie School of Architecture. And, um, and uh, and so I had a I had a sense back then, like from pretty early on about this thing called the Chicago Fair, and it came up again in you know various uh, architecture history courses that I took, but it was always kind of like you know it was a fair, it was a thing that happened, you know it was just Chicago, and um, you know it it it, it appeared and in a very short amount of time and then it you know was torn down immediately after and it was kind of the the ser you know the back of the cereal box version of the history there and and that's one of the yeah. things that amazes me about it matthew and sorry to cut you off but mm -hmm. chicago world fairs like my oh it has a deep place in my heart for some reason i'm tied to that thing mm -hmm. but whenever people talk about it like you're saying it's always just kind of blown over it, it yeah it happened it came in but then when you go and research it, the amount of information on it is just, there are mountains of books on it, um, you know, pictures, firsthand accounts out there. And, and it, it, it just doesn't make sense. And that's why I, I still, to this day, I, I, you know, I've read probably about over 50, 60 books on, on the fair or Chicago itself, you know, in the 1800s. Cause that whole story of, of Chicago in the 1800s being basically a ghost town in 1830 to, you know, million people by 1890. Um, it's just, it's an amazing and fires all along the way, totally, you know, wiping out the city and they just keep rebuilding. And it, right. it's, it's just this amazing city that has, you know, it, and my thing with the world fair is I, I haven't been able to prove it yet, but it seems like these world fair cities, the Buffaloes, the new Orleans, uh, uh, Nashville, St. Louis, St. Louis, San Fran, New York, yeah. were like the old world capital cities. Right. These were hubs. These were centers in 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 not, you know, the realm that we're in, but the previous whatever that previous generation is. I, I really feel like there's roots in those cities or some ener energetic value to the land. You know, I mean, Buffalo, obviously, you have Niagara that has has massive energetic value up there. But you have the canal systems that are, you know, some say could be hundreds, thousands of years old. Um it's just, but Chicago, let's get back to Chicago. Cause that's the one that, that amazes me. And it, it, it's amazing how 200 buildings were just put up in, you know, two, two, a little over two years and then all destroyed, but maybe a handful that still remain today. Yeah. A little, a little, maybe even a little under two years, n not counting for our a couple of brutal Chicago winters in which, you know, at which time it's extremely difficult to, to, to build and see, and, and see, that's the thing. It's, it's Chicago was the only thing that I heard about the Chicago fair. I never heard about all these other ones. You know, I never, I never knew that there was an exact replica, if we can call it that of the Parthenon or the Pantheon 
in Nashville that was left over from, you know, that World Fair. Um, I, you know, and each one is more exquisite and beautiful than the, than, the, than than its predecessor. Like St. Louis is mind blowing. Oh. Buffalo, the buildings in the Buffalo Fair are mind blowing. And when they come out with the story of, um, and it's always the same story. They're built in like less than two years, hundreds of buildings. You know, wooden staff, acres. right? It's all wooden staff architecture. Yeah, wooden staff. But then you know, there's that book that Howdy Mikowski wrote, where he actually gets into chronicling some of the statistics around it, and you find out. But there was millions of pounds of steel that was brought in. Oh yeah, I have I have construction photos over and over. I mean, you look at it's all steel frames they're putting up. Mm -hmm. so, so I don't understand. So what does it mean? Like if you if you build a masterpiece of a building and then knock it down, you could say it was temporary because you just knocked it down. <laughs> so and yeah, and so you know, this topic sometimes is really hard to get into. And I guess we'll do our best to navigate through it because there's so many different aspects to it. There's so oh, many angles everywhere, down. Matt. I mean, we can go, we can go uh, the <clears throat> architecture. You can go down the landscape, um, you know, landscape architecture. You can go down the the exhibits themselves. The exhibits the themselves. Of, the Where did all the, how did they get all this stuff? This exquisite, extraordinary, super advanced technology on display, all brought to each one, put in these enormous halls. Some of these, some of these halls were, 10 11 acres in 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 size like acres of interior space filled with ex exquisite um technology and then you have the building that was left and they each seem to have left the building behind which is really curious right and so in in chicago it was what it was the arts hall which the is palace now of the fine museum. arts yep. yeah the yep. palace of fine arts which, which is now the museum of science and industry and just that one building alone defies the narrative that it could have been built along with all of that other stuff. And we haven't even gotten into the electrification aspect of it, right? And ginormous dynamos and like millions of light bulbs illuminating this thing in the late 1800s. And so you can go to Chicago now, visit the Palace of Fine Arts and it's a massive dome structure that used to be up against the waterfront you know, against the lagoon, the water going right up to its steps, um, which is an engineering feat in itself to build lagoons, right? And bridges and um, moving sidewalks, and it goes on and on. But that building itself, like, I don't see, I've, I, I've worked uh, for enough architecture firms. Like I, I worked on, there's the uh, local high school, the Linwood High School here. People can look it up. It's a pretty cool building. And I think it was 400,000 square feet. It took, I mean, it took years just in the planning stage, you know, and then years of the design stage and then years for the construction phase. And there was a team of, um, at one time we had 17 architects on this one project and that was just one building. And so if you look at the, if you look at this, uh, what's now the science, uh, uh, the music museum of science and industry, you know, copper dome roofs and granite columns and marble, you know, statuary. And, and it just goes on and on how exquisite this one building is. And they say that they had to make that one permanent because they had a world-class exhibition of artwork in it that was worth, you know, so much and this and that. And it's, so they had to make that one as a permanent building. Yeah, it had but to be really insurable, because, right? Yeah, because so so could they really have built just that one building in two years? And then when you compare it side by side with photos of the other ones, the architecture looks awfully similar. It doesn't, it's not like you can look at one and say, Oh, yeah, that one was made out of plaster and lath and you know plywood and cardboard and bubblegum duct tape, and that and 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 this you know palace of fine arts was made with copper and and um, you know, granite marble. So, so it's just every time you kind of like pull on a thread uh, with these world world fairs. Um, I mean, like this is temporary, it just, Matthew. It starts. Right? I mean, this yeah, is the horticulture the, building. That's just the horticulture building. I mean, some of them have towers going up 
you know, 200 feet into the air, and you're going to say that these were built as temporary structures, but you have 27 million visitors that are coming in and out of these. And and who are your visitors? It's not you or I. These are these are mainly wealthy people, right? And then the others that they want to that they bring in here, like you or I, that need to be pushed through, basically. I mean, I feel like they were almost indoctrinated in there. Well, you wonder about it because also at the same time, and I don't hear people talk about this aspect that much. When as soon as the Chicago Fair actually opened in 1893, there was an economic depression. Yes. So 27 million people somehow had the means to travel across a country where the, you know, the frontier just closed, the railroads had just been laid and people are, you know, scratching a living out of the soil, you know, with this manifest destiny thing. And, and um, they're still pushing Indians onto reservations and somehow 27 million people made this pilgrimage to this site during a depression. In six months. Right. 27 million people in six months. Now, I mean, uh, granted, uh, Chicago had an abundance of hotels. That was one thing. The more research I do, I mean, Chicago had hotels everywhere. So they had places to hold people. But 27 million people in six months when the city only had about 3 million at the time. Yeah. And so and that's another thing when you compare it to, you know, Chicago proper. You know, Chicago had gone through, you know, the great conflagration in 1871. It was rebuilding. They were still rebuilding, building buildings that, um, what is it, the federal building. Can you pull that one up? I think it's the Chicago federal building that was right outside of the fairground. And they were supposedly still building that one at that time. And when you see the scale of this sucker, it's mind boggling. But somehow they had enough of like super advanced old world old school um uh craftsmen that they were able to that thing <laughs> yeah i mean it, it's they it's were able to build all of this stuff at the same time and and mind you matthew right next door to the fair they were working on the university of chicago that rockefeller and, had built right and they well. were calling that the, the you know that university their mascot just so happened to be the phoenix you know cuz everything oh, in that and that university had burned in a fire in 1890 i believe um so yeah it's just it's it's amazing that and and like you said not only were they building this fair but there's other buildings going on massive structures supposedly going on at the same time Mm -hmm. as as you're building out 700 acres for the world fair in, a, in less than two years yeah and when you and what, when you talk about what what does it mean again going back to that question of what does it mean to be temporary there was supposedly there was three times the amount of electrification electrical power being generated just for the fair as compared to chicago the entire city of chicago but there's 10 times new york city 10 times New York City, but they put all of those resources into a fair at a time when we're in a depression. I mean, again, it so so it suggests that, you know, to start with, the narrative is nonsense. And that these buildings, if if they weren't all already there, then a significant percentage of buildings were there, at least in some state of um even if they were in a state of ruin but that something was there that they built off of and, and that's with. what that's what i've always wondered is what are they building off of because there's no way and we've mentioned it briefly there's no way they lead all the electrical did all the landscaping on a swamp and and, and managed to build all these buildings in two years i mean it just Oh, and by the way, they were having major union issues, major strikes. Union major issues, like you mentioned before, terrible winters. They had a tornado come through that destroyed, uh, what is it, the cold storage tower or whatever. That was the same thing that burned in a fire, got knocked over during construction by a tornado that came through. So, I mean, all these things, and they still managed to pull it off. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
And so, you know, this research community has done a pretty good job of um, digging through the archive of photos and documentary evidence, you know, to the extent that exists. I mean, there are a lot of uh, books that were written at that time about the fair itself that were distributed across the country. Um, but so I've got this book. It's called The Spectacle in the White City here. <clears throat> oh, I am all ears on this. This is and this is our buddy Arnold's who had the Arnold, sole right. Um, is it AC Arnold? I forget. I'll find it right here. But yeah, the guy's name is Arnold. And so this book really dives deeply into um, the photographer himself. And so this photographer, they plucked out of obscurity. He was from New York. And somehow he shows up in Chicago and the blink of an eye gets picked up by the head architects. Was that um, Burnham? Burnham and Root. Yep. Yeah. So he gets he gets discovered by Burnham and put at the head of fo photographic documentation of the fair itself. He gets sole rights, essentially. He got sole rights to where they blocked the efforts of any other photographers to, you know, to document what was going on starting from the construction. I mean, they had the thing on lockdown. I mean, it was basically some kind of, they must have had some kind of like, you know, major policing operation because other photographers couldn't get in there to show what was going on. And so when they, you know, so there's some information that this book reveals about, um, and some quotes I'd love to share with you and your listeners um, about uh, the, 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 the sort of the tone that was set around uh, giving this guy exclusivity to this uh, documentation effort. And that's one of the things that's always blown my mind about this is, is that they, they were very, they made it very hard to take pictures. A, the security team, you know, the, the Chicago World Fair police were mm -hmm. heavily policing cameras and they were making sure they checked that you had your ticket if if you did have a camera to be able to take pictures right they, you had they, to purchase a, a permit yeah they charged an absorbent fee if you wanted one of the um the the old school standstill cameras you know one of the box ones it would cost ten dollars a day to rent that and that was the equivalent of your whole trip to to get to the fair to stay at the fair everything so right. think about that folks i mean it's just and and another little twist to it, the, the name of the camera that Kodak produced that was used at the fair was the Columbus. So oh that's cool. Just a little <laughs> a little tidbit to tie in, yeah, you know, I going back to, always goes back to Columbus, Columbia, somehow. We love our Roman god and gods and goddesses. But well, let's get let's get back into Arnold because yeah, I cannot it, wait to hear this. It's C D Arnold. I I I get it mixed up because acdc but his name is cd arnold um and so the book so what this book spectacle in the white city um what it's what it starts out with is he came out of obscurity from new york showed up in chicago how he was discovered by by, uh, by uh, burnham is unclear is what it says so there's a few quotes can i just uh, read from this uh go right ahead quotes i think you're gonna really like this so quote just exactly how Arnold got the commission to photograph the entire process is only partly clear. Arnold would photograph the construction of the fair, rendering its roughness in the best of lights, disguising its haste and often frustrating disorder. Arnold, and these are quotes I pulled from different parts of the book. Arnold had complete access to all aspects of the construction process uh, to make a, an encyclopedia an encyclopedic array of pictures describing the process of modern construction of a new city from scratch. So they do refer to it as a city. Arnold was a documentarian. He was simultaneously a rhetorician, even a trickster. 
His responsibility lay not simply with depicting, but with transforming the site and its elements, especially at the beginning of the construction phase, when so much of the place was mud and chaos. Much that was dramatic and significant about the construction process was carefully excised from Arnold's compos composite. The collapse of roofs, the horror of mud, the sheer quantity of trash and construction detritus did not appear in his photographs, or if they did, they seemed transformed. He made the very qualities of the pictures seem instead the qualities of the buildings and the spaces themselves. The White City then was as much a product of Arnold's photographs as it was of the architect designer's decisions. And then Arnold was attacked for limiting access to the fair by photojournalists working for the media outlets and by competing photographers, a devoted servant to the overarching ideology. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's oh, that <laughs> just rich. that nails it right there, because it's exactly what they do today. Right. Nothing has changed. They give certain people the ability to show you the picture that they want to get across and anyone that wants to get involved that's on the outside you're going to you're going to hit roadblocks all along the way and it's going to be their vision and their version of the story that they're going to tell you and show you yeah it's almost like from its inception they were crafting a reality to project out to the country and yep. and, and that we were to just take on board Here's the narrative and you're going to, you're going to accept it. it. It's, it sounds Matthew, like a giant spell, a, a giant magic spell, because I, I found go. a quote um, from the fair of, of one of the fair goers. And it said that from the beginning to the end, the people walked around like they were under a spell. Mm -hmm. And it's like, there's something magical about this. And, and it, you know, I think when you think magic, I'm not talking, you know, voodoo mm -hmm. magic. I'm talking like television magic, right? The same thing that they do to us through the television screen. I think they did that version of programming mm -hmm. through the fairs. It's spell casting. Yes, absolutely. So when they turn around and say, hey, all this was just temporary. And oops, it just like burned down in a fire when we were done. But that's part of the ritual. What are we to believe? Right. That's part of the ritual, that burning at the end. I, I feel like that's mm -hmm. that's sa symbolic. That's part of their ritual. And and they even said there's quotes from some of the guys in the beginning saying that this thing has to go out in a blaze of glory. It has to go out as big as it came in. Mm -hmm. So they were going to burn this thing down from the beginning. That, well, that, that people, was... people who do practice magic and I, I don't I'm not one of them. I, I, I don't. But I try to educate myself. Um, so they'll tell you that if you want to cast a spell, you want to conjure something up from the ether into, you know, material realm, you might create a sigil, which you would do some incantation and then you'd take it and you burn it. And, and what else happened at this fair? You had the mayor get assassinated, right? Right near the end of it. I mean, so that's blood, another sacrifice. Yeah. Sacrifice, right? You had the fires. And then what did they do? They burnt all the buildings, but they saved Columbia till the end. And then they, they had a special ceremony and a special send off where they lit her on fire all by herself at the end. And that was like the end of the ritual. And you know what's weird? You know the book, The Devil in the White City? Yeah, that's the one, you know, like, you know, uh, let right where they, you know, popularized this idea that there was this fair, there was a special event back in the, you know, late 1800s. And half of that book is all about, you know, some serial killer. Yep. And it's like, well, you just made that weird. Yeah. You know, so that... He's from out here, too. He's from New Hampshire. Oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah so it's like in the popular imagination to the extent that people think about this at all it's like simultaneously what will come up in their mind is like oh you well, know the serial killer and have you heard Eric, have you heard matthew that they're going to uh read they're gonna they're doing that show they're uh, they're bringing out devil in a white city and yeah it's Leonardo, like Keanu Reeves. Leonardo, or... 
Yeah, I heard uh, it was it was Leonardo DiCaprio, right, and Keanu Reeves. But I, I think heard so. Keanu, I heard Keanu Reeves dropped out. I I, heard I that hope on so. The podcast, but I don't so, know. I have a feeling it's going to be trash. I I put no faith in any of these productions. I think it's going to be them trying to spin it somehow. Well, that's the thing, and like it does seem that now that this 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 history is gaining some traction in the popular imagination, they've got to get out ahead of it, and they'll probably show how it was how they you know performed this you know magnificent feat of building this very temporary fair under these arduous conditions, and you know so yeah they'll they'll spin it away because we're probably getting over the target of something. Even if it's just the idea that, you know, our, the, you know, those who create the narratives um, and, and, um, that, that we accept as history are casting spells. And yes. so if that catches on, then what else will start to unravel? And, and I think that's what Howdy McCoskey hit on in his book, too, right, was, was the idea of this coming out. Right. This just being being unveiled and and the fact that now they they really it's almost like they have to address it and they're going to put a television show out there to give you their angle, um, their response, because it has kind of gained this groundswell uh, from, you know, researchers. People are now digging into it. And even if it's a matter of saying, OK, we have found these things to be lies. That's good enough because now we've proven that it's not all true. And and, and that's the, the point that Howdy makes is, is when you can start just putting the lies off to the side, it's like peeling an onion. Now you know, okay, I'm getting closer to the center. I may not get the true answer, but I know mm -hmm. what's false. Yeah. I like the way Howdy puts it. It's like, if you want to get to the truth, yeah, discard what is provably not true. Yes. And we know, I mean, I mean, I've talked to a couple different architects and common sense tells you that to put this up in the time frame that they did for the amount of traffic that came through it. Now, if you told me they did all this in two years and there was 10,000 people that came through, yeah, you could get away with some real shoddy construction. But when you're going, you're putting up these giant towers that you're having people go up in, you're investing all this money in to, to electrify the city. I mean, I find it really hard to believe that this is built real shoddy and temporary as they, you know, claim it to be. And again, it's like if you're building a building, I think what the man, is the manufacturer's hall where they did the opening ceremony with 300,000 capacity. Yeah, they yeah. had like 130,000 people inside of it for the opening ceremony. You don't <laughs> you don't build that shoddily cuz you just don't. No, I mean, think about that. You you in even ventilation. You have to have proper ventilation in there for 100,000 people. I mean, it the just roof doesn't... has to not leak. The roof has to hold up, you know, feet of snow and Chicago winds. It's called the windy city. Now, that is a very interesting one, because one of the things that I found in my um, in my digging through was that right after the World Fair, they tried to rebuild the Chicago Coliseum and it caved in on them. Now, if if they had all this expertise after just completing this fair in record time. And you're telling me they can't put up what would be the equivalent of a mid-size building from the fair without it collapsing on itself? I mean, it just seems very suspect to me. Yeah, so it suggests it suggests that um, that level of um, you know craftsmanship or skill sets wasn't as readily available you know, as, as the story, uh, um, the story of the history of this world's fair, uh, would claim. Now, what, did you find anything else interesting about Arnold that really discredits his, not, not his whole, I mean, obviously he took pictures, but that he really angled it. I mean, those quotes pretty much told us that he was showing you what he wanted to show you. Yeah, it's it's the that last quote that um, that he was attacked for limiting access to the fair. So one, it's, it's, it says that he had the authority to do this or there was people around him that had the authority to just 
you know, because there was other photojournalists that wanted to, you know, capture what was going on. Oh, I'm but sure. Think was... about like the, the the publications, right? You had the New York Times, probably the Chicago Tribune, all these big publications at the time that want to get these pictures to their people. Yeah. And so and so that was another interesting aspect of this book was that a lot of what went out to the public, because there was an, a, an organized effort to get all of this out to the public across the country in periodicals and newspapers. and You mean and so a coordinated on. effort? Yes, a coordinated effort. No, they wouldn't effort. do that, would they? Yeah. <laughs> they might have. So, and so, but the, so, it, so a lot of the descriptions of the fair itself were, uh, were, were, were crafted before the fair actually opened. So there was this interim period, apparently, where the, the, the building of the fair pretty much, you know, they said, okay, it's done, more or less. And then, before it opened, that's where that's when they did a lot of the, uh, 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 the photographic documentation that we see today. Before it was fully, you know, taken over by the public and what have you, and filled up with people, and um, and so and then a lot of the stories, the narratives that they spun about what the fair itself was, were also crafted at that time. So it was, you know, so there again, it's. What they put out there to the popular imagination, to the to the, all the people, millions of people across the country, uh, uh, what they the stories that they gave them were 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 crafted. They weren't exactly, you know, they weren't the reality of the experience of being at the fair. They were, um, they were a story. And, and what what you're talking about is go look at some construction photos. There's no horse shit in any of them right there 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 would be horse mess on the streets from horses pulling in the materials and pulling it out there would be building materials laying around there would be people around right if this was around the clock construction like we see but these are very well set up photographs almost like scenes that they've yes. they've placed for you everything's very clean everything's very tidy neat I heard one time, I heard that Walt Disney himself went to the fair and was inspired by the fair. And I found 1893? out- 1893? Was he old enough to have- No, been his, his father worked his, at the fair. His father, father was a fair. craftsman who worked oh. at the fair, who inspired Walt. He okay. would tell Walt tales of the fair. And that's what inspired him supposedly to do Disney. And then- Disney got involved with the New York fair. I believe it was in 1963. One of the world's fairs in New York is where he actually, um, he designed and released. It's a small world for the first time. Interesting. I'm so glad that you knew that. Cause I had heard something about Disney being influenced by the fair. Um, yes. Yeah. Cause he's a Midwest guy. He was a local, he was, he was from the area. Yeah. His dad worked on the fair um, his father was a craftsman by trade, and uh, yeah, he really, he supposedly that really inspired him to get Disney going. Because I mean, isn't 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 Disney basically playing the same role of shaping of spell casting and shaping you know the the imagination of a population? Absolutely, as the fair it is, itself, it is it is exactly what. It, it's the modern version of this right it's the it's a television it's it, they're telling you what they want you to see and how things they their vision of things and that's what I, I what always blew my mind about this fair is that you have this very roman look right this very old exquisite grand look but then inside were all of the modern appliances so they were they were giving you the best of both worlds they were showing you what the old world was like outside and what you know the extravagance of it outside but then when you went inside they were showing you this is the industrial age that we're taking you to this is these are the things these are the products that we're going to give to you or that you're going to need to go on in this next industrial age that we're bringing you into hmm so it was almost like they they showed you what what you had and now this is what we're going to give you this this thing that you had is of no more we're going on to this new age and is it what we're going to give you or is it what was what we 
um, what is what we have, uh, but we're going to roll things out in a different direction. Because like you showed that picture before, you just pulled up a picture of a, an interior shot of one of the halls. And there was there was a, a tower there that was all lit up. Oh, the Edison Tower. Yes. Yeah. Let me, let me pull that back up here. Uh... It almost seems like a lot of what they were putting on display was this kind of like Tesla-esque Antiquitech type of technology. And so it's almost like it's almost like there was, you know, they're showing the technology of, you know, that sort of went along with old world architecture, you know, because now we know that there was these things like moon towers and, you know, and people have looked at, you know, um, you know, these antennas, this antiquitech that's on all of those old buildings and like the radiators, um, you know, the, the radiation fireplaces and so forth that, you know, it's suggested that uh, uh, somehow they were, um, they were, pulling basically pulling etheric energy you know out of the atmosphere and from the ground and connecting a circuit and running it through these you know fireplaces these heating elements um that were able to heat these old buildings without combustion and so it's almost like they were showing putting this technology on display but at the same time kind of turning it into a a, a fantasy Right? Exactly. It's like they turned that into the dream state, into the fantastical, and gave us this new grid that where energy is, you know, produced through combustion at one end, ran through wires into the homes all over the valley and the mountain, <laughs> and uh, and metered and controlled and 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 um and and that's what they call electricity. But what the technology that they were showing um, sure seems to indicate is that we, you know, we had a different type of um, uh, technological, um, uh, uh, set a different uh, uh, store of knowledge of um, using um, and manipulating the elements in a way that was not reliant upon uh, you know, the factory production of, of, of power, electrical wires and meters. Non-metered energy was the key. And I, I think that's, that's the, the, the area that they've done everything they can to cover it up. Right. I mean, you see it even today with anyone that can come out with any sort of uh, hydroelectric vehicle. Ooh, yeah. that gets shut down real quick and that person tends to either disappear or you yeah. know not be heard from again i mean they went so far as to change you know change science itself i mean yeah. they took the ether away you know einstein proved that there's no ether it's like really and or that's Mikkelsen, the mickelson morley experiment proved that the ether isn't real it's like we're just a bunch of bumping particles you know, separate from each other in, you know, in a, in, in, in a, um, a vast emptiness of space. And so that's, that's what they, that's the, uh, the, the science um, that they've allowed us to, you know, cogitate over for the last hundred and so many years, but maybe, maybe that's not true. You know, maybe the ether is real and, there's ways of um, moving energy, drawing energy, channeling energy in ways that are actually much more organic, much more healing, much less sort of, um, yeah, destructive. And we know there's doing. energy there. We know there. I mean, look at a spark, right? I mean, it, it's there. There's energy in the air. It's just how do we harness it? And there was, it seems like that technology has been lost or you know intentionally or unintentionally mm -hmm. right i mean uh and, and that's a battle i've 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 been fighting myself with lately a lot especially after you know we've had a lot of talk about uh there's been some people coming out lately that are saying you know that the whole idea of etheric energy and and that these any sort of buildings or moon towers or light towers having any purpose other than what we've been told by the narrative is a waste of time 
And I just find that hard to believe because you look at all these structures across the, the globe and where they're placed and their significance on where they're placed. Because when these buildings are destroyed, there's mm -hmm. something as significant built right on top of it. And, and that's the, the key to this realm, I think, is, is we've, we're in the era where we built on top of everything. So what, what our history lies beneath our feet. Now, whether that's because they built on top of it because of, you know, the change in the Terra through, you know, uh, liquefaction and, and earthquakes and floods and all that stuff. Um, but I think that is one of the keys is getting back to understanding the natural ways and the etheric energy, the telluric energy that's in the ground and the air. And, and how do we harness that and get off of this, mm -hmm. you know, this Rockefeller system where you have to pay for everything. I mean, guys, we pay for water nowadays, right? You pay, that's insane. <laughs> we pay for water. Um, you know, it's pretty soon you're going to pay for air. There's going to be a tax on air, right? I mean, yeah. that's where they want to go with this whole carbon credit and, and things mm -hmm. like that. This is, it's so against the natural way and against any sort of natural principles. And, and I think that's the way of this industrial age, right? I think their whole uh, niche in this is to get us as far away from nature as possible get us into that metaverse, right? Get us connected in there. Don't, don't, don't get out in the woods. Don't, you know, uh, build, grow your own food. Don't be able to, to be self-sufficient. We want you to be sufficient on us. Yeah. I mean, isn't growing your own food, isn't that like an application of free energy? I think you're terrorist nowadays if you grow your own food in some people's eyes. Well, some places it's actually illegal to collect your own rainwater too. Oh so my yeah, God. Uh, how, how insane is that? Mm -hmm. Right. Think about that guys. It's in, it's illegal to collect water from the sky. So when they say it can't be done or when they say that there's no such thing as free energy, um, I, it's, it's a complete misreading. It's a misunderstanding. And it's like, they're looking through the wrong end of the telescope. You know, they're starting from, the perspective that you know this this you know big science trademark um is is the truth be and all end all we can't do that thing that you guys are just you know waxing on about on your podcast and so forth like that that's that's just again that's the realm of fantasy but if you just like pause you know and you look at like take a cathedral right you take a cathedral and that and, and, you know, that cathedral is made up of, let's say, you know, granite marble and and materials that if under um, in certain applications, like if you took, um, you know, just the quartz out of uh, um, the granite and put it under pressure, well, you might be able to create a crystal radio. Uh, because piezoelectricity allows, you know, allows for the, um, you know, the, the generation of, of voltage, you know, just through putting, putting crystal under pressure. So if you build this entire, like, massive crystalline structure around these types of materials, like, you know, using copper to line domes, and copper is conductive. We know that, and and these um, these particular types of stones have elect they actually have electrical properties just by being just by their being. And they're being under pressure and arranged in, in such a way as to um, you know you, these structures really do seem to me like um, like crystalline. And then and then you uh, you know oftentimes a cathedral these old world cathedrals will have water currents running underneath of them underground rivers and, and that generates electricity and then you have spires going up into the atmosphere um right and and even like even like a spider like baby spiders they've done experiments where you know baby spiders will crawl up onto the the tallest grass in the field to float away on their web Right when they just drift off into into the sky to to you know when they're leaving the the egg, well they've done experiments where they put the you know babies you know egg egg sacs in closed containers where there's no wind currents because the the thought was well they're just drifting on the wind, 
but the these baby spiders will crawl up on the blade of grass and they will drift away in a closed container where there is no breeze. So what's going on? So what they've demonstrated is what they're actually doing is they're they're catching electrical currents. Oh, so wow. just a blade of grass and a baby spider shows that there is there's an electrical charge between the positive and negative of the earth ground and the atmosphere right uh, bees know which flowers to go to to pollinate based upon electrical charge right so so this is real stuff you know uh, you know birds and animals migrate based upon you know a, electrical charge so so you know why can't human beings and all our and in, in 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 you know with all of our um, ability to think and and <laughs> and divine um, also understand these principles and apply them. Um, so, and then you add to that you add to to that uh, you know uh, 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 these pipe organs that are some of which are producing forty thousand you know tones, some of which are not even audible to the human ear. And then you and then you you know throw up a rose window, which is just like those images that you were showing there of cymatic patterns. You have wrote massive rose windows um, that look are just like a cymatic pattern. And so you're telling me you're telling me this isn't channeling energy. And you know we stick the freak <laughs> on the end of it because we're all tired of paying them you know, for electric bills and paying for oil that, you know, is getting more and more expensive for no good reason. So we call it free energy, but really this is just natural energy. It's the forces of, you know, of life itself. There you go with the DNA. Yep. Yeah. Right here. I mean, it's, it's, it's everywhere, right. And it's sacred geometry. It goes back to the building blocks of life. You know, you look at these patterns and each pattern has its own significance, right? I mean, every every it co corresponds with a different frequency. And we know being that the impact that frequency has, especially on water, okay? And now think about human beings. We are mainly water. So think about the impact that frequency has on us. And if yeah. you don't think that these towers that are popping up all around us and these little devices we carry in our hands aren't affecting us on a frequency level guys we're being bombarded on a daily uh, daily basis with bad frequencies negative frequencies that harm our bodies um these here were natural frequencies they were meant to keep your body in tone that's why people went to church it almost seems like they went to church you know, you say you go there to, to, to see God or to get with God, but it was to get right. It was to get your frequency lined up. They would go there. You'd, you'd listen to these massive organs playing in these, um, you know, acoustically tuned buildings to give you the frequencies that would heal you. I mean, now, I, yeah, I don't I mean, know anybody yeah. that goes to church and they leave feeling worse than they, when they went in. Right. And so, and then you had, you add to that too, uh, you know, choirs, you know, singing these, these incantations and these, these, these chants that are vibrating with the structure itself. And so, you know, it's not so outrageous to suggest that these are healing structures, that that was their purpose to heal and uplift the body and the spirit. Because we create all these divisions, like the body versus the spirit, or science versus spirituality, and those are those are absolutely false dichotomies. I love that diagram. That's beautiful. Absolutely, it's it's a diagram showing the flow of energy. Yeah, yeah, and it's structurally based, right? I mean, you look at this, and this was designed. It matches almost to a T. Beautiful. And, and it's 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 interesting because you look at these windows and it shows you how it works with the cathodes and <laughs> it just seems like there's more to it when you when you look at the scheme of things it, it, the 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 similarities are too coincidental yeah sometimes you just have to pause to take it in yeah and this is from our our, our friend over iwar 
who, <laughs> you know, did a hard 180 on all this stuff after putting out all this, this great material and, and all go back this to, research. Go back one. Can you go look at that? Okay. So there you go. Um, now, okay. Now, what are we looking at? Is that, is that a symbol or is that an apparatus? Oh, that's an apparatus all day. That swastika, yeah that that is that is an apparatus. That is a harnessing device. Right. Because you look and it goes down. It has levels. Right. Right. It comes into the into the. Um, oh, it's a that? fractal antenna. Exactly. And then you get into the ball. Now the balls are interesting too because there's been some claims of of them possibly containing things like red mercury or mm -hmm. other liquids that would help the whole process you know and, i just i was i was interested in in finding out when and why they made mercury into this you know you know illegal basically to poison have. yeah yeah and so you know what i you know what i uh, read was these um what do they call them mercury mercury amalgam batteries or something they're little watch batteries right so basically what they did was because industry created disposable batteries that were that were causing environmental problems because we use them once and we throw them away by the millions and billions of batteries well that's that's harmful for the environment so we must make mercury <laughs> oh, uh, right illegal to own yep but so now we use acid maybe, instead. maybe that was, maybe the problem isn't the mercury maybe the problem is the way industry just uses things up and discards it um and and there's some special properties to mercury because um, you you hear a lot about uh you know ideas of of the chinese using red mercury uh under a lot of their old cities and structures and things like that and and uh you know possibly red mercury being used throughout the realm and it's like yeah for it to be vilified nowadays i don't you know rule anything out if it's that if it's been that twisted you know, the other, the other one I wonder about is, is always lead paint. You know, hmm. they always, they always now, you know, you say, uh, they, they took out all the lead paint and was it that bad? I mean, it, it, with all the blocking properties, we know that lead to have, right. You throw on a lead vest when you go get an x-ray. Why, hmm. if you had rooms that were lead wall, you know, lead paint, you, you would be able to keep out certain frequencies you would think almost. Well, I think with the lead, I mean, the thing I've always heard and just working in the in the building trades uh, for so many years was that, um, you know, the rehabilitation of, of lead based uh, structures or structures with lead based paint um, that, you know, that's really bad to breathe. So that's, I'm sure, true. And I've always heard, too, it's like the lead, the, the chips of paint that would flake off the ceiling and fall into the baby's cribs and they would eat it. And um that seems to point to another problem um, of maybe poverty or maybe, you know, um, improper maintenance or maybe. Maintenance. Yeah. And, and, and yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting because it's like when you, when you get into like, well, what's really the problem? Was it, was it the mercury in the battery or was it the way we were using batteries and throwing, discarding them? You know, is it the lead paint or is it the way maybe, it was being used and applied and then just um, discarded. So, but no, it's, it's fascinating to look at this stuff, a spark plug. Um, yeah. It's fascinating. And sometimes I'll be honest with you, like, you know, I've been looking at this stuff for years and um, I, I absolutely have, um, you know, I feel like I'm looking at it all through a new, a new lens. Um, so for 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 one like history history and architecture uh, when I look at them now it I get so excited about it because it seems alive and I feel like I'm part of it. Uh, I'm right? with Whereas you. When yes. I studied architecture history in college, it was the most god awful boring topic. I remember we had these like index. This was back in my first go round when in the '90s when I was studying at Virginia Tech and we had these index cards of cathedrals and we had to. Just go through each one and memorize. This one is Notre Dame. This one is, you know, this this one is that. And it was just like it bored me to tears, and I can barely. Do you pay think that's intentional, Matthew? 
Um, you know, at some level, for sure. I mean, there's Rockefeller education, you know, you know, the, the way we the way we uh, take in information, uh, the way it's all set up and structured so that it's all by rote, you know, for sure. I don't think my, you know, professor was in on it. I think that they were just doing what they knew how to do and transferring information and, you know, with their tenure position or what have you, or maybe they're just an adjunct professor or and and or an, an assistant I, I i don't know I, I think that they were sincere and that's the best method that they had to be able to teach um but for sure the way education is structured yeah no absolutely yeah i think i think the system <clears throat> itself is is structured in that way i think the professors themselves are teaching what they believe is to be the way it is because that's the way they were taught Yes. So I, I don't I don't think there's any scheme on that side. I think the scheme is at the top level down. You know, yeah. I think the creators and the masterminds of the education systems are the ones. I mean, it's not the it's not the foot soldiers. It you rarely ever is. I mean, they're they're just the guys that are just trying to get by. Right. So it's interesting be, being being in the world of architecture is interesting because you actually get to, you know, you get to be involved with the creation process. And so it's like I, I mentioned that I worked for a, a school's architect uh, for a while. Um, so that's like, you know, a sacred obligation. It's like, you know, that's the way I took it. And I take every project that I work on as a sacred obligation. Um and especially more so when you're building a um, designing a building that children, hundreds of children are going to inhabit, and it's going to shape their consciousness and their minds um, as, you know, developing human beings. Um, so by contrast, my boys, uh, my youngest boys, um, uh, middle school was rebuilt just a couple of years ago. Um, not too far from us we can walk you know we can walk to it and I you know I was very excited it was like wow they get to get to have a new school and like what a privilege and so I watched very closely when they were putting this up and it was just like it was just soul-sucking to see what they were doing and what they ended up doing and so first of all it's just all boxes right it's just just box upon box upon box and it was all steel studs you know, and I don't know, maybe, maybe they're aluminum studs, but it's just, you know, basically before they clad it on the, on the outside, you could see it was just a, it was just a cage made out of metal studs. And I'm looking at this and knowing what I know, I knew enough at that time that like the materiality was really important and how it's going to like, you know, amplify or dead an energy. And it's basically, I'm, I'm saying to myself, like they're basically, they're building a, a Faraday cage. That's all it they're is. doing yeah. the opposite, the opposite of like a, a sacred building is doing, you know, like this kind of healing energy, this uplifting vibration, so forth. They're doing the opposite. They're building a Faraday cage that is going to block out any positive, like atmospheric or ground, you know, energy. And then they're sticking it full of Wi Fi, this and, you know, 5G, that, which has an amplifying effect internally. And then these poor children, then they're asking them to perform at their best or at least behave. And it broke, you know, broke my heart. So it's, you know, at some point, you know, all I, I take all of this stuff actually very personally. Because my kid still goes to that school. And so some days I'm like, you know, damn it, I know better. But at the same time, it's like, well, what are we going to do? Yeah, you know, you're damned all, if you do, damned if you don't, right? Yeah, I mean, we're all like pulling oars and doing the best we can, given the circumstances that we have. But I think it's really important to be able to look back at what was with open eyes, you know, and clear eyes and see what the best of what human beings were able to accomplish to be able to, you know, point our compass, you know, into the future where we want to actually see things go. And that kind of leads me into something that that I be, I wanted to talk with you about, especially is is the materials that go into these buildings now. And and one of the things that you mentioned is that um, you know you had some information on the on some old world concrete and and some and American cement and things like that because the materials themselves have changed. I mean the the red bricks right. that were used had. Um, you know, uh, electrical properties to them. Uh, it's been proven that they were, they had conductive properties in, in the materials, in the bricks. 
that it was a different um, uh, composition to the the concrete and the cement that they used back then compared to what they use today. Um, and I had a, a one of my friends. Uh, she messaged me on Instagram one day and she said, you won't believe this. She said, I live in in a building that was a really old building. She's over in England. And she said that they were trying to fix the exterior. And mm. it was a couple statues and some of the facade and they could not do it. They tried for six or eight months to fix this and they could not get it. They would they would get it done and it would fall apart, you know, within a couple of weeks. And they never were able to um, fix it. And she, she was asking me, she's like, do you think they just lost the knowledge or is it they don't have the materials anymore? I And I said, I think it's kind of a combination of both. Now, now was, uh, was it the, um, was it for lack of um, the, the skill set or was it that they were using the wrong materials? She couldn't really tell. She just uh -huh. said whatever they were doing, whenever they would fix it, it would fall apart within you know within a couple weeks time frame yeah and they this went on for for months on end them trying to fix it and then repair it and then repair it and they could never get it right yeah and so, that's what she was wondering she was wondering you know was it a, a a lack of knowledge on their part did they not have the right materials um you know i'm like i i can't tell and she sent me a couple of pictures back then and i'm like i can't tell from those shots i'm not you know right. any sort of expert on it but I just found it interesting. And and when you mentioned the old world uh, concrete, I'm like, oh, this is one of the things I'm fascinated by because I've heard uh, a couple different takes on some of the old world materials and right. what went into it and um, and that, you know, they've they've intentionally changed it now. Um, I, you know, I, I'm yeah. not well versed on it, so I would love to hear what you have on it. Well, it might it, it might very well have been that they were using the wrong type of cement, and so like believe it or not, concrete well cement is a is a fascinating uh, topic. Um, now, so you have up there Portland cement. So Portland cement was introduced into the building trades um, late late in the eighteen hundreds into the early nineteen hundreds. Um, we we weren't using Portland cement, but they started importing this um at great cost from port portland as as i understand um portland england and they were going through you know great um trouble to import this in and lo and behold it turns out that we have a native um uh um uh, uh, source for a far better uh, um, quality of cement that actually rivals um, Roman cement that they built the aqueducts with the type of cement that continues to harden over time. And, you know, um, they talk about like the, the Brooklyn Bridge. Um, so this cement that I'm referring to, it's called American rock cement. And there's, there's different um, mines around, around the country where it was sourced. And uh, so they talk about like the Brooklyn Bridge won't need maintenance, you know, tuck pointing or, you know, repair to this, to the mortar. We're talking about the cement that's used in the mortar between the bricks and the stones, you know, for, for centuries, for two to 500 years. Um, and the type of cement that hardens underwater, right? And so, um, so I found out about this uh, listening to, uh, I think, I think it was a Conspiracies Are Us podcast, um, which I just love. Uh, I love the exposés that uh, uh, that podcaster puts together. And oh, so they do great work over there. Yeah. And so he got into this question of cement uh, a couple of years ago, and it really piqued my interest so much so that I actually went to one of these mines that's called the... Um, um, the Widow Jane mine in, in Ros Roslyn, New York. It's in the Catskills. And uh, I was actually out in the I was out in um, New York State participating in a, um, a construction project putting up with these one one of these wooden yurt uh, houses um, that I had designed and I was helping assemble uh, assemble the uh, the prefabricated kit on site. And I took a side field trip to this um, to this mine in Roslyn and so so conspiracies are as 
he he pointed to um, where this mystery started to open up. This mystery of like our indi basically an indigenous source of this um, extraordinary material because the Port Jefferson, not Port Jefferson, sorry, um, Fort Jefferson, uh, which is the largest uninhabited or unoccupied masonry structure in the United States. It's way off the Florida Keys, like in the middle of nowhere in the ocean, all by itself in, in a state of ruin. It was built for supposedly for military purposes, again, in the late 1800s. Like everything, all these old world buildings supposedly were built in like 1880s, 1890s, um, which is, is, is a whole rabbit hole in itself. Like we must have had this extraordinary renaissance of architecture that was completely forgotten about. Um, in the late 1800s. So well, that was this, the that was the whole city beautiful movement, supposedly, right? Is 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 that late eight, 1890? I think that started is is what they say 1890 to the you know probably early 19 maybe 1910. They give you yeah, like it gets back years. to the World Fairs and the World Fairs were supposed to have been you know inspired the city beautiful movement. Um, yeah. Yeah. So this Fort Jefferson with its 16 million bricks, um, it's way out there in the middle of nowhere. And in the 1970s, apparently they were doing repair work on it, restoration work on it because it, you know, it was suffering from age and neglect. And so what they were doing wasn't working. And so they realized that the cement that they were using wasn't chemically bonding to the uh, to the old cement. And so they were using Portland cement. Right. And so cement concrete is very chemically specific. So it had, you know, like is going to attach to like so, sort of thing. And so through analysis, they realize, hey, this is this is a different material. Uh, this is a different material than we're used to using. And so that, you know, through their own investigation, they realized, oh, there's this entire source for natural American rock cement up there in Roslyn, New York and rediscovered basically this source of, of um, what turns out to be old world cement. And so what's so interesting about this, like versus Port Portland cement, it's a bunch of additives, it's a bunch of stuff thrown together, you know, to make this one compound. Whereas, <clears throat> whereas American cement is, it's one thing, it's the rock, it is the rock itself that comes out of the ground. And um, I'm by no means an expert on it, but as I understand, they heat it up to a certain degree and uh, they, they uh, pulverize it and then they turn into, they turn into the cement. Now, when you look at the list of buildings and I have, I have here this book, uh, it's called American Cements, okay, by Uriah. Cummings. This was written in 1898. And so this guy went through um, 300 pages here of uh, in exquisite detail going into all of like the chemical properties, comparing the Portland cement to the American rock cement, because already by the late 1800s, um, they were they had moved on to Portland cement. And he was he was basically writing this thesis to demonstrate to the building industries that the American cement is far, far superior. And here's why. But what's so interesting about this book is that after his 300 pages of, you know, of, of painstaking research, he makes this um, disclaimer that he tacks on to the end. So can I read you another quote here? Oh, I'd love to hear it. Yeah, so let me see. So supposedly, by the way, um, supposedly the American rock cement industry started in 1818. This is his assertion. Um, now, <laughs> the guy that's supposed to have created the, uh, like, you know, established the first patent for this American rock cement, his name was um, Canvas White. Which I just think is great. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> Why so, not? No. So it all started in 1818. Okay. So um, so he starts out, says, or I should say he concludes, 
From the year 1818, when the rock cement industry was first established in this country, the American rock cement industry was first established in this country until 1882. No public statistics were kept to show the extent and growth of this branch of the building trade. <laughs> so they, they just didn't No, they just didn't keep any records. Which is fascinating because then you you couple that with, and I'll continue, but you couple that with the fact that uh, the United States Patent Office burned down in 1830-something, five or so, and then they moved it, and then it burned down again in, in, in 1877. So twice over, we lost all of the records of all of our patents of you know industry in the United States. So we keep losing our records. Right. So he says that no, no records were kept from 1818 to 1882. Since 1882, however, such records have been faithfully kept by the United States Geological Survey in Washington, D.C., and have been published yearly. Um, he continues, during the past 30 years, 30 years, the author, Uriah Cummings, has been adding little by little to the items bearing on this subject, either by correspondence or in conversation with the oldest persons engaged in the industry by gathering bits of family history and in ways too numerous and uninteresting to record. The difficulties encountered in the compilation, in the compilation of these statistics during the period named have been much greater than would readily be believed by a person who has never attempted such work. <laughs> Information, in, <clears throat> information seemingly reliable would accumulate in the course of years and be found at last to bear but a slight resemblance to the truth. But by dint of persistent effort and careful gleaning and sifting, the author has been enabled to form a table covering the entire history of the industry in this country, which he feels assured will be accepted as being practically accurate, and in the entire absence of any other known effort in the same direction as authoritative. Wow. Like Dude. they just, they just didn't, they, they're just telling you they didn't keep any record of it. And it's, it is, it is Nobody what knows. it is, guys. Nobody knows. Nope. Is what he just said. And this is the guy that wrote the history of the, the most important building other than the bricks and stones themselves, the most important material that made up our old world buildings in that built America, that built urban America. Now, can I share a screen for a second here? Go right ahead. Just to kind of put the punctuation mark on this. Let's see. So this here is a partial list of buildings and structures constructed with natural cement. Now, this is this is a this is a list that's actually in this book as well. Um, there's an appendage, an appendix back here uh, that they reproduced online here for our convenience. That shows. I don't all... see anything. Is it sharing? Oh, did it not share? Share screen. Let's see if we can do this. Oh, I got to press the other button. Share. There we go. Okay, good. Now I can see it. Yep. Um, and when you go down this list of buildings, it is, and this is a partial list. These are all union depots, um, dams, canals, bridges. There's Fort Jefferson shows up on there. Fortifications, state houses, capital buildings, federal buildings, railroad bridges, Iowa State Capitol, which is yep. awesome, a five dome masterpiece that was built in the middle of the wilderness because, you know, that's what farmers do. Yeah, and the um, Dubuque Railroad Bridge. I, I, It's funny because I uh, did a, a renovation on an old building out there for, when I was working for IBM. We took one of their old buildings and renovated a couple floors. And I remember that railroad bridge in Dubuque, Iowa. It's like, what is this doing here? This is amazing. Right. And it just goes on and on. Um, 
And what is this list from? Now, so <clears throat> Rosendalecement.net. Okay. Yeah. They've got their own. And because there's a historical society there in Rosendale, New York. They love their mine. So I went and I visited this mine um, in person. And it was in the middle of the winter of 2020. And when I went into this, to this place, it was there was snow everywhere. And, you know, I was the only one there. And when I walked in, I couldn't believe what I was seeing. I it felt like it felt ancient. I mean, this the ceilings were like 30 feet above my head. And this thing apparently is like 32 square miles of 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 um of cavernous mines and one of the fascinating things about it um that i found out straight away was that um so modern geology geological engineering in mining as applied to mining allows for 60 percent uh mine removal versus 40 percent of columns remaining to hold up the structure above to make sure that the roof of the cave of the mine doesn't collapse on you so the, so, so they allow for 40% of, um, you know, the material needs to be left in, in the form of columns to hold up the structure. In this mine, uh, the rooms, what they call the rooms, the, the, the voids where they've re removed the material, they removed 90% of the material and left only 10% in the structural columns. Wow, and so they consider it an, an engineering mystery and a, and, a, and a marvel to modern geological engineering because you shouldn't you shouldn't be able to take that much material away. So there was even in just the mining process, there was like a a, a, a pool of knowledge, a store of knowledge that they had. Uh, and, and not only not only that, add to that that a lot of the a lot of the mine itself was at steep slopes, so it wasn't just horizontal yeah and so when you when you have columns at steep slopes this thing just goes on and on the, the, the amazing forces, i can't believe this list the forces on those columns is is, is increased uh um dramatically so so they don't even quite understand like the engineering that went into the mining process let alone you know let alone the fact that the building industries themselves forgot that we even had this local material that, by the way, built the country. It built the country. And then when when about did they stop using it? So as I understand it, and I'm going to stop sharing. I mean, this just goes on. It's just oh, that, that, this can, list is amazing, Matthew. You can click like, Niagara you know, I'll, Guys, I'll put the link. <laughs> I'll put the link to this in the show notes so you, you all can go check it out. But this yes. is, you got to see this list. This is unbelievable. It just it's all the old buildings that we marvel on. You know, it's these buildings that we look at in structures and canals and dams and courthouses and insane asylums. And, and so we're right, Matthew, to say, how did they do that? Right. I mean, with these materials, they're using materials that we don't use anymore. Right. They were using a material that was indigenous to this land that somehow was forgotten about towards the late 1800s, early 1900s. It just got phased out, even though it was stronger. Even though it was locally available, it had properties uh, that marvel, you know, that that equaled the you know Roman cement that built the aqueducts, and it was right, right here, and so we just stopped using it, or or we didn't know what we were doing. We were reclaiming existing buildings that we didn't really have the means to maintain. Yes, and so we brought what we could from Europe. You know, and put together this inferior inferior product called Portland cement, um, and start building our modern infrastructure on top of what was already here. That's that's just fascinating because I I don't think I don't think too many people understand that I don't think people truly understand that the materials were abundant here, and that a lot of uh, architecture was built from materials from here, but we don't exactly know when and and who or who built them. Yeah, and now here's another angle, and we go back to this question of like what what could what were these buildings like? What did they did they have some special property, right? Um, 
uh, that somehow uh, was 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 um, where they energized somehow naturally, right? So then you look at what is the chemical composition of this natural cement, and it is calcium silicate, which is you know you mentioned that we're you know our bodies are made up mostly of water. Well, calcium, right? The mineral is what's in our bones. So you have calcium, and you have silicate silica. which is silica which is what you know silicon valley all that chips well right? and, and they there's some people that say that that humans used to be silica based that's interesting so that's I mean, another that's, yeah, that's I mean, another rabbit a hole. hole that's a whole nother rabbit hole but yeah there's there's a line of thought out there that you know prior to this rendition that humans were silica based at one time well, that so, life was life was silica based. So quartz, quartz is made up of silica. Yes. Right? And again, it goes back to this piezoelectricity. So you put quartz under pressure and it creates charge. Yep. Right. So you have massive buildings all over the place built with a, a material that is, you know, made up of the material that if you put it under charge, it create, or put it under pressure, it creates charge. So did these buildings have a special property that energized them? I would argue that, yes, they did. I, I'm with you. You know, the more you look into it, the more you consider the, the materials, the placement of these buildings. You know, they weren't just building these buildings on a whim. They There was research that went into where they were going to put these buildings, you know, physically, like on the land where they would lie. Yes, in addition to right the the whole question of ley lines um, and uh, what's the fellow's name that gets really into deep into the uh, question of ley lines? It's on the tip of my tongue. Um, Mark over at the uh, My Family Thinks I'm Crazy podcast uh, has interviewed this guy a number of times. Sh Peter Shampoo. Sh yes. Right, who does um, a lot of like really interesting uh, research and, and, and presentations on ley lines and the place, Michelle Gibson's another one, how cities are aligned on these, you know, uh, almost like, you know, pearls on a string along these energized lines. And so, um, you know, so if we're dealing with materials that have special energetic qualities assembled in such a way through sacred geometry, flowing water and electro uh, uh, magnetic um, materials with electromagnetic properties and conductive properties, and you and you align them where the energy is, you know, um, where, where there's these energy uh, uh, focal points. Well. I mean, we have a different kind of a civilization than, than, than what we're living in right now. Yep. Oh, absolutely. Oh, wow. It's, it's just, and, and that is a whole nother um, line of, of research is the ley lines and how those play in, because I, I read a book on um, the cathedrals of France and how all of the cathedrals, you know, the old cathedrals of France were all placed on these sacred grounds that had you know ley line or or telluric energ energetic fields they said in them and that they were using the these fields you know for these buildings and that that's part of the reason why they were placed there they were sacred spots right right so you know and then <clears throat> there's another um there's another uh, um, something to throw in the ring here uh, in the, into the mix another another ingredient which is these star forts oh now you're talking okay let's go right so again <laughs> it's like how did i go through you know i've been in the building trades pretty much my whole life you know since i was a kid i, I spent six years at the university level how did i not even hear about star forts until you know, the New Earth, New Earth podcast came out with this a few years ago. And then you turn around and you realize that they're everywhere. There's thousands of them. They're all over the world. They have remarkable similarities to one another. 
um, they're, they look like, again, like many of them, like these exquisite cymatic patterns. They have underground passageways and tunnels and so forth. And, you know, and then you turn around, you look again at like, you know, the base of the Statue of Liberty, right? An 11 pointed star, right? Made out of like megalithic granite blocks. I think it's granite. Somebody can check me on that. Um, and then like the Star Spangled Banner was was uh that was drafted at Fort McHenry, right? Yep. That's a that's a star fort. Lower Manhattan. There was a star fort. And they're supposed to be these just these bastion forts and they're just for defensive purposes. And you know what's even crazier I found is that the where the World Trade Centers were was mm -hmm. a star fort at one time. Is that the location? Yep. Yep. Let me see if I can I can pull up this map. I knew it was in Lower Manhattan, but I that would be just that would just be too too uh, rich. Let's see here. Yeah, I found a I found a map that basically uh tied it to <laughs> uh, let's see to um it, it had it right on the tip of Manhattan, right where the towers were um of course i'm not gonna be able to find it right now yeah maybe throw up a link later on i'd love to see that but that's precious and so i have this book here um this is this is just an amazing tome cities of the world Ooh, yes now that's another one and there's this shows and i just got this like a, a couple of months ago this shows hundreds of um paintings from the um from the 1500s 1500s and 1600s showing that all of these cities that are now you know the cities that we know and many that have been forgotten through time um were in their inception star fort cities they're you know not just star forts but star cities yes that entire, cities, and that's the other thing there were entire cities not just these, you know, people think, oh, they hear Star Fort. It was like this one area. No, there were entire cities. I know that uh, Basel, I just actually, uh, I'll pull it up right here. I was just about to make a post on this because uh, I just, let me share this. Uh, share pre uh, photos. Because I just I just looked at this and they, they were showing how Basel was a star for a star city yeah and then uh, let me see if i go yeah and then they destroyed it this is what it looked like afterwards and they destroyed it so yep. and this this just shows hundreds of such cities and they always not always but oftentimes have you know the same themes where you have a cathedral at the center you have water running around the perimeter of these like fractal like wall systems right um this one i don't know if i'll be able to get it close enough to to the camera to see um i will try apologies if this doesn't work out oh, i man. guess it does gets lost in the in the ether there yeah can you, can you see this yes right there you're good all right i'll try to i'll try to freeze frame all right so this one fascinates me because can you see right here yeah there's yeah it's so, like a little out structure yeah, so what you have here is you have, you know, the, the waterfront, you have the Star City, you have the cathedral at the center of it doing of all course. the cathedral stuff. You have water running past it. I think there's water running past, the, yeah, running through it and past the cathedral. Over here, this is fascinating. Over here, it's a ruin. You have a ruin of a smaller cathedral structure and a decommissioned star fort where it's a dry moat and they went through all the trouble to sketch this into this drawing. So wow. it's almost like I look at this and I'm like, holy crap, this is like cell division. This is like, this is like an organic growth where they started out with this smaller um, structure, smaller, you know, star city. And then the cell grew or the organism grew. And they out, and they out, they outlived the, you know, this smaller, portion decommissioned it as they grew into this larger realm wow and it just shows the organic uh um growth of a city in this diagram 
And you don't see that too often in modern, right? You have to, and that's why I tell people, I'm like, guys, if you can get your hands on old books, I'm like, please do. I'm like, that's where the information is. Even, even the information in the 1800s is a little manipulated, but if you can get it, the source material, you have a, at least a chance to, to get some bits of truth out of it. I've started collecting books, like when I listen to podcasts and, and you know, I may not, not get to them right away, but I collect them. I, I get them when I can, even if I have to pay a little bit of money because, you know, I don't know, maybe someday the internet goes out, but you know, it, it's so important to preserve this knowledge. Well, that that's my thing too, is, <laughs> is between, I tell people books and PDFs, if you can get your hands on them, do, because they're going to eventually it's going to, you know, the internet's going to go down or they're going to start scrubbing stuff like they have in the past. It's just that virtual book burning and you really have to get your hands on it and hold on to it because, uh, you know, it's, it's not, it's not going to be there forever. It, or at least in the way that it's out there now. Um, and, and the other thing with star forts, did you know that there's essentially two types? I didn't know this, that there's the Vauban, uh, style and then the Kui Hearn style. No, tell me. Uh, so Vol the Vauban is is more of a uh, the military uh, style. Um, okay. I believe the gentleman's name was Sebastian Vauban. He was a French guy who created them. And then the Kui Horn ones are the ones that we see. Those are the ones that mainly incorporate the water, right? Those are the more intricate design okay. stars and things like that. Well, that but, makes sense that there would be two types. That absolutely makes sense. Yeah, and both. Yeah, because so, you see some of them, and they do look like forts. You could say, okay, that has some military, you know, application for sure. You know, yeah. But then you look yeah. at some of them, and they look like it looks like a snowflake dropped acid. Yeah, exactly. Like, why is the military going through that trouble? And 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 how are they doing this? How are they getting these? perfect angles you know they're doing it in the middle of water a lot of times the the precision is just it, again it just raises questions that what tools did they have to be able to pull this off that's one of the most underappreciated aspects of this of of this uh research which is the what the yeah like you said the tools that it would take to just do the survey like i've laid out foundations i've laid out you know rect rectilinear foundations uh for houses it's a lot of work like and then and then there's a whole different um approach to laying out a roundhouse you have to find the center and like every time i drive a stake for the center of one of these roundhouse structures it's like the sacred moment because you know everything that happens from then on to laying the foot you know pulling the radio radial dimensions for the footings building the footings building the foundation assembling the floor and the kit above and you know and you have the roof structure and the whole thing and then you and then a family moves in and their kids grew up there and you know it's so it's like laying that one stake but it's a lot of work and that's just for like you know these little um you know these smaller scale projects but when you when you zoom out and you're dealing with you know fractal geometry out in the middle of a you know in the middle of some rugged terrain Half or up on hills, these, they're building these things on mountains. Yeah. And it, it just, yeah, it, it beggars belief. Um, you know, this stuff is just really jaw dropping. And I, I would love to see more of more of this, more of this sort of like percolation of, of one, you know, um, that it even existed. Like I said, I went through six years of architecture school at the university level. I never heard of this stuff at all i would love for architecture students to be watching shows like this and you know just having their imaginations just you know uh expanded in 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 whole new ways um ways that they just you know we, we don't we don't get this stuff we certainly don't get it through public schools or even like you know just at you know grades high school level you know this this type of information is really coming through these type of podcasts right now. And I, I just love that this is, it feels like there's this golden age of podcasting going on. Oh, I'm with you. I think the information is, there's so many eyes on it now and so many different perspectives being brought to the table. 
that I think collectively it's, it's, it's moving this thing forward. Um, yes. I, I, I think because initially, yeah, I think there was a lot of, I, I had a lot of skepticism about it because <clears throat> anything that's that out there, right. How could they cover it up? You know, but then right. you start getting into it and you start digging away and you're like, okay, well, I know this is false. So let me go on and you go on. Okay. Well, I know this is false. This guy, he's given way too much credit. How did he do all this and all this? Let's look at him a little bit more. And you start to see the cracks in, in the story that they've put out there. And that's when it opens up. And then you see something like, you know, Chicago was the game changer for me. Once I read Howdy's book and really looked at that fair, it's like, wait a second. I talked to my brother, um, who's an engineer for the state of Connecticut. And I, I, I asked him and I'm like, does this make any sense to you? He's like, Pfft. He's like, I, I understand, you know, I'm looking at it from today's building perspective where we have all these union rules and everything. And he goes, even if I throw all that out, he goes, you give me, you know, you'd have to give me a couple thousand guys round the clock with all of our equipment going round the clock and not hit any snags to even, you know, consider this. He goes, the landscaping alone, that's going to take forever. He goes, that's the hardest part. He goes, the architecture, we can get that going. But then I said, I said, what about the foundations? I said, we're talking swampland here. Wouldn't it be hard to get good foundations to these buildings? He's like, well, it would be a challenge for sure. And I'm like, yeah, so two years, does that seem plausible? He's like, not really. Not if right. not with the size that you're talking. And that's that's where I always go back to is is the fact just tell me, show me where where did you lay all these foundations? Be so because what, what I've seen, you know, and I'll let you go here in a sec. The one thing that I've seen is just a bunch of uh, pylons driven into the swamp. And then next thing you know, there's a massive building up there. Right. No, it's it's nonsense. There's definitely um, like these quotes from from this, uh, you know, spectacle in the White City. Um, you know, the, there, a spell has been cast. A, 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 you know, a, a web has been woven, a story has been told. It doesn't match with what we're looking at. And so then the next question is, well, what is the truth, right? What, if these, if, if, if the story we've been given about either the fairs or, you know, the laying out of this, of the uh, ur urban um, infrastructure, uh, 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 you know, in, 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 in cities across you know the country if if this if the narrative doesn't add up then what is what what was what 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 what's up <laughs> what's going on what's america like where are we and who are we as a people and um you know and the, this question of well, what did the indians know and that's an interesting question to look at in itself we could talk about that but it's like what's the history of this country really was the erie canal really dug out of the wilderness in just like five to seven years or whatever they say it was i can't remember exactly right now 350 miles of like you know brick lane um uh canal systems and 17 different um yeah. you know oh new, it's super it's... sophisticated locks and and on on and, and and if that wasn't built in that time at the same at that time that they attribute it to when well to whom do we attribute it and what was here before, you know, and why in, in, in with all of these records that we discuss, all of these re this record keeping that either didn't happen, oops, or was somehow lost to fire or, you know, you know, conflagration um, or, 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 or war or cities being bombed. We haven't even talked yet about all the cities that were burned down in the 1800s and all across the land here, um, usually concentrating on the, on the, on the, um, the business districts right where the record keeping would have would have been yep what what was here and you know in what in what sort of um you know memory loss are we all suffering yep. what sort of amnesia have we kind of gone through as a people and then this big you know question that's looming over us nowadays with this great reset notion that's been foisted upon us again have we been through a reset? Is the country as we know it the product of a reset civilization? 
And was there something here that we're only now beginning to scratch the surface of? And that's the million dollar question. Right. And that's, that's what I, I wake up every day. And that's why I keep digging into these books is to hopefully someday get a clearer answer. Cause I don't think we'll ever get the answer, but I think we're getting closer to understanding that the narrative, you know, we've been given doesn't make any sense that it's, it's a purely Eurocentric version of this country. And you know, there's so much more to it to, to, you know, my, I always go back to, I find it hard to believe that for 1500 years, you know, post Christ, that nothing went on here, that there was just these savages that just roamed the land, you know, in, in, in tents essentially, and, you know, lived off the land that nobody set up any sort of civilization, city States. Um, there was no construction at all. You know, it's just just a bunch of people living off the land naturally. And but then you get into things like when you get into Meriwether Lewis and he's an interesting character because once he gets west, sees whatever it is he sees, he writes in his diary and then ends up with two bullets in the back of his head and pages of his diary are ripped out. So what did he see going west that wasn't supposed to be reported on? That's a good question. And that's one that that just sits with me because he's famous. Right? I mean, he's one of our, you know, so the big Lewis names and the con- trails yeah. all over the place here in the Northwest. I mean, yeah. Like, a- and Adam, yeah. Adam from uh, Deborah Gets Red Pilled did a great show on uh, Meriwether and Lewis and that whole okay. story because, you know, he, that's what he said. Ev- up here, it's everywhere. And then you, you start un- unwinding it and you listen and you're like, well, what did he see? out there what did he see out west because there's rumors that he saw these giant structures these massive building complexes that were were out there that look a lot like what's behind me here these you know moorish greco-roman style buildings that Mm. you know weren't weren't on record at the time Mm -hmm. and and who and going back to then who built them yeah yeah well i love watching those john levy videos where he goes through you know salt lake city and and you know that's the, that's one i have the, not the touched there. yet uh-huh. and i'm dying to get into because that's a mystery in itself yeah not only were they building the main temple which beggars belief but oh by the way 30 me- 30 miles away they were building you know, some, you know, cathedral and then some remote place over there, they're building an insane asylum that was yes. a sprawling palace. And they all kind of look crazy the same. people had to be put in. Hmm? And they all kind of look the same. The insane asylums? Yeah. Yeah, they do, don't they? There's they're all these palaces. giant castle looking structures yeah. and you're like, this is for like derelicts and like mentally ill people. That's what we're going to put these folks in. Mm -hmm. No, it's just uh, that and orphanages. Those Mm -hmm. those two sets of architecture have always blown my mind. Cause yeah. Yeah. It's very strange. Massive. Yeah. Massive complexes that, you know, you're thinking if, if you're really doing this for, you know, (laughs) What, what, you know, they would consider almost the dregs of society at the time. Why would yeah. you be building these elaborate? No, you know, we, we, this country has some of the biggest prisons and in, in, in the biggest prison population for sure in the world. And they don't put them in palaces, man. No, look at those things. No, it's, it's bleak. Yeah. You know, the reality of what they do with the dregs of humanity is bleak. And so, yeah, they're not out there building palaces for them. And yet, in our history, all across the land, the insane asylums and the orphanages were palatial. Well, that leads me to the, another thing we wanted to touch on, the uh, Smithsonian Castle. Ah, <laughs> okay. This one, I, I just got a, I, it's funny you mentioned that because I just got a, a stack of um, history books. It's the history mm-hmm. of the 1800s. Mm -hmm. And it goes year by year, basically, you know, with like major events. And one of them on there was the founding of the Smithsonian and it showed the Smithsonian castle. And I'm like, 
what is this? And then you yeah. mentioned it and I'm like, oh, we got to talk about this one. Can you pull up a picture of it? Yes. Let's get a little context. Let's see here. All right. Here we go. All right. This is it. There you go. All right. And again, this, interestingly, this building is on the list of um, buildings that were constructed using American rock cement. Ah. Of course, right? Why not? Uh huh. So the architect, um, my, my brother lives in Washington, D.C., so um, I was visiting him last year and took a little tour. I, I, because of COVID, I couldn't get in. <laughs> they had shut it down to the public, so I just kind of walked around the outside and looked up the history. And um, so the architect's name is Adolf Kloos. He's known as the Red Architect. And one line of reasoning is that that name, he was given that um, nickname because all of these exquisite red brick uh, buildings all over Washington, D.C. and the environs are attributed to this one guy. And the list is like, it's like 80 buildings, right? Of it's course. Like another one is like, I just, he, he did them. And <laughs> they're know? all built within a decade, I'm sure. Right. Yeah. So Adolf Kloos, as it turns out, so 90, 90 masterworks. Okay. So somehow this cat was a friend and confidant of one Karl Marx. Of course he was. So the architect who designed Washington, D.C.'s uh, architectural masterpieces was a friend and confidant of Mar Karl Marx and was, con and was a member of, uh, I believe it was the Communist League. He's from Germany. He's not born here in the United States. He's born and bred in Germany. He came, he emigrated to the United States. And what did he do is settle in the German community and founded a newspaper where they printed German American stories and promoted Marxism in America. And without even taking a position on that, it's a curious story. Yeah. <laughs> right. To to for for the guy who's credited with 90 masterworks to be a avid communist or Marxist. Yeah. A friend I, and confidant of Marx. Um, <laughs> it just goes back to that whole concept of characters. Right. That they're all connected, that it's it's not about, you know, what you do. It's about who, you know, and 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 what your place is in this in this show that they're putting on. Yeah, it's really strange. It's just really I mean, whatever thread, it's like there's this whole this spell casting thing, this web, they've this this web that they've woven is really it's just like this giant tapestry. Right. And you pull on any thread. Right. And we were talking last time um, during that group call. It's like, well, you know, where did you how did you get into this? Well, I was reading old books and what I found didn't add up. And how come there's no books that can be found before the 1800s? And, you know, and, you know, you just you came to it through history. I came into it through the building trades. And it's like you just pick a thread and start pulling on it. And the, the, the fabric starts to unravel. And this is just one. It's, it's fun. It's fun to look at the architect of the Smithsonian Castle um, and, uh, you know, wonder how it is that a member of the Communist League who was considered a, a, an important agent by Frederick Engels, you know, somehow came here out of obscurity, started a newspaper for the German American community and somehow untrained became the architect of Washington, D.C.'s masterpieces. There he is. There's our friend. That's him. All right. Yeah, I want to I want to see what this guy is bringing to the table here. Adolf Kloos. All right. 
So, oh yeah. So we got some of his. Uh, I just I get I love looking at. Ah, oh, these things suck. Some of these yeah. pictures are terrible. But I mean, look at these buildings. Yeah, I mean, it's just one after the other. I mean, the the sheer size and just I mean, look at this. The grandeur, the scale, the magnificence of look the architecture. That. I mean, yeah. He must have been a master craftsman. <laughs> That's all I got to say about that. I mean, look at this. It's just, I mean. And, and, and again, it's like it. It, the untrained architect bit really gets to me. And I kind of take that personally, too, because it takes a lot to design a building, a good building. Well, and that's that's the angle they play with a lot of the Chicago guys. Like, I, I don't know if it's Burnham or Root. One of them, you know, was just picked it up just yeah. a couple years before the fair. And then they created a mansion for one of the richest Chicago guys, ended up marrying his daughter and then got the Chicago world fair. Yeah. It's like, what? It, that's the thing. How do we it's go from same... a pauper basically to a mm -hmm. prince? Well, how about the crystal palaces, the, the 1850s crystal palaces in England? Um, when he designed in two weeks. Well, the, you, so this, the architect of the first Crystal Palace, well, what's said is the first Crystal Palace, um, this guy Paxton, he was the gardener. Yep. And he created it in two weeks. And he just designed this, pulled up the Crystal Palace, 1851. <clears throat> Which, by the way, they, that was the first World Fair, right? The Crystal Palace. And uh, and so then, as the story goes, designed by the gardener. There it is. Yeah, that's that's what gardeners do on their time, on their on their spare time. So this um, not just an exquisite architectural masterpiece, but an engineering marvel. And there's like millions of square feet of plate glass in there at a time where like the plate glass wasn't even being like factory produced like you know in, in 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 large lots it wasn't being mass produced yet so this would have been like hand-blown crystal you know glass plates for this and then the story goes after the after the fair was over they moved it <laughs> they took it apart and they moved it to another location a little bit rebuilt it a little different that one was a little different and then the whole thing burned down but they, they yeah and and the first time they built it in eight months and then, and then when they tore it down and rebuilt it, a little different. It took them about two years. So, I mean, it's just full of holes. The fact, look at this building. Anyway, that's watching this. Look at this building, and think about the effort it would have taken to take this down and reconstruct it in 1851. We're talking, guys. We're not talking 2020. We're talking 1851. Look at the size of the people. Yeah. They're ants here. Look at them down here. They're little specks. It's unbelievable. But yeah, I mean, this is just, it just goes on and on. And then they, you know, and then, and that's a whole nother rabbit hole. You start looking at the crystal palaces that they built and every crystal palace that they built all, and there wasn't just one, there was, there, they were all over the world and they all burnt down by fire. I just found out about the one in New York state. In New York, they had a crystal palace that was also burned down by fire. Oh, for the World Fair in 1853. That was, okay. There yep. you go. Yep, mm -hmm. they had one in 1853. They had them in Canada. They I, I did a I did a whole little I put it out on my YouTube uh, channel. I used to do stuff on, but I put a little video montage together of uh, a bunch of different crystal palace fires because you know there were there were actually. I think over a hundred crystal palaces at one time, um, a variety of sizes and scopes, obviously, but the, the vast majority of them all burned down. And it's just a, it, it's a while. And, and in a couple instances like this one, um, I know one or two in Canada, they did the same thing. They, they tore it down and then built it somewhere else. And it's just, it's one of those where you scratch your head and you're like, you know, or you think about Chicago, right? In the 1850s, where they say they raised the city six inches. They were yeah, just moving the, buildings all around. Wasn't that after they rebuilt it after the fire, supposedly? They they then, once they finished rebuilding it, they then decided they needed to elevate it for whatever reason. And so they 
Well, it's hard and, to even say this stuff because it's so silly. Wait, and you want to know what's even, what's it, to, to to make it even crazier? The guy that supposedly was the master building lifter came from San Francisco in 1850. Perfect. So, so in 1850, when San Francisco is in the the gold rush, right? So there's probably not a whole lot of massive structures that you're picking up and moving because the, the, the population of San Francisco is relatively small and they've been hit by a couple fires at this point too. But yet he's, he's, he's perfected lifting massive building. And, and in fact, he could lift an entire street block at once, raise it up if needed. So was it 18 in the 1850s that Chicago was said to have been re-elevated? 18 i think like 55 or 56 so that was, was before the fire before it was fire. yeah it was after one of the earlier fires chicago had like four or five fires from 1850 to 1870 oh wow and, they had, and, I, know, and, I know they had at least i mean well and you look at it i mean by year they had a couple hundred fires a year but you would figure that you know, a lot of those were just like trash fires and small shanty fires and things like we're that. We're talking about major portions of the city being incinerated. That would be, an, yeah, there were four fire. fires like that. It was like 18, I want to say like 1853 and then 18, mid, early 1860s, late 1860s, then 1871 was the big guy. <clears throat> and then in 1871, I know that you've talked about this in previous podcasts where it wasn't just Chicago. It was like four other cities were burned down around the Great Lake regions on the same night. At about the same time. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah you look at that one and that one just doesn't make any sense because you start looking at like... um you know, where, where the fires were and, and how they started. And you're like, wait a second here. We're like, how is it possible that all these started at once? Mm -hmm. And you're like, no, 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 this doesn't make sense. Like, how is that? How is that even possible? Like, no, it's, and then you get into it and you're like, well, wait a second. Here's, Here's the fire. Oh, actually, here, let me share. I'll, I'll share it with you guys what we got for uh, for when you look at it here. Pestigo, so, yes. Yeah, so you had, so in Wisconsin, you had a million point, 1.2 million acres burned over on this side. And actually, both sides of Green Bay were on fire. So they said fire was jumping over Green Bay here from the the uh east side over into Peshtigo. Yeah. Then you go down into Chicago, we're told this fire started by a cow tipping over a lantern. And then you go on the Michigan side, you had two and a half million acres burned on the Michigan side. And, and this is all the same day. October 8th, 1871. And and it goes all and then you keep going over, you go all the way over east even further to Lake Huron. And there were fires over around Lake Huron too, over into Ontario and in Canada. So, so it, we're we're looking yeah. at a stretch here from, <laughs> you know, you're going across all of Lake Michigan, going across the land of Michigan, going across Lake Huron and into Canada. So yeah, it suggests that there's some kind of like natural catastrophe, some cataclysm. Was it meteors? Was it plasma event? Or, and 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 they, or they, something it's not just darker. a forest fire, right? Because when you start looking at the details of some of these, um, you know, like in Chicago and in Peshtigo, you have, uh, you know, steel and iron that are melting, and from a purely wood fire, that's not going to happen. That only, you know, a wood fire will get up to you know low two thousand degrees, and it takes like twenty three hundred degrees to start melting that stuff. So. We're we're talking about things that aren't natural right there. Have you, I'm sure you have, but maybe you can pull it up too. Um, looked at the Wikipedia list of um, city fires. And you, oh, you don't even have to. It's just, it's extensive. It's right? unbelievable. Like every major city in the United States, and we're just talking about the United States here, somehow or another burned down in the 1800s. Like New York. San Francisco. Well, and, Seattle, and it's not it's not Chicago. once, Matthew. 
New York is like three or four times. Um, and then, the, and then this history is like we hear about the Chicago one. We just hear about the Chicago, and we hear about San Francisco and the earthquake, but the 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 fact that so many cities in the United States burned down in the 1800s, and then were rebuilt from the ruins, is just doesn't make it into the discussion of right. our national history. No, not at all. And that's and 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 that's what we got what we talked about before. It's not only the the devastation to the land, but you get the loss of the <laughs> records. And that's how it makes it easier to okay. So you get into the 19th century here, right? And we're looking at uh Buffalo. Yeah, you got Horse Detroit. Pit. And these are all from the War of 1812, right? You got Buffalo, you got Portsmouth, New Hampshire, you get into New Newfoundland, um, let's see, Fayetteville, Augusta, Fayetteville again, uh, the second great fire of New York in 1835, Charleston lost a thousand buildings in 1838 a thousand buildings look at this new york again in 1845 another 300 pittsburgh a thousand buildings in 1845 uh st louis toronto yeah st louis that was a big one in 1849 and you look at the devastation <clears throat> and 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 some of these and and the buildings the it doesn't look like a fire it looks like they've been bombed out. That's the thing that gets me when, it, when you know, and there are photographs of these cities after these conflagrations and you look at them. And first of all, what you don't see is you don't see a bunch of like wood shacks and shanties that are like, you know, like I was taught in architecture school. It was like they didn't have fire codes, right? And so yep. <clears throat> they just built these buildings too close together, heated them with gas and kerosene and they kept burning themselves down. But that's not what you see in these photos. You see massive granite columns you see you see stone upon stone exquisite brick buildings you see old world buildings lying in ruin and rubble yeah so you i mean we'll take a, a quick look here before we get going but yeah i mean <laughs> look at these fires like i mean this is baltimore and this is boston right here I mean, you just go from city to city, and this is Chicago. I mean, just look at the devastation from a fire, guys. And look at these aren't wood. You don't see wood. These are all brick no. and stone yeah. that's turned to piles and rubble. And, you know, it's just, it's amazing. I got to be honest. Um, Matt, you've done some really great exposés. Look at this building. Oh my God. Yeah, you 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 look at this and 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 I gotta take this stuff in small doses sometimes because like I'm a, a bit of a like a, a an a building empath, right? Yeah. People like are really sensitive to other people's emotions. Like I'm really I've done so many remodels and renovations and design and built how you know buildings, mostly houses. I feel really like viscerally connected to to buildings and structures and I see them as organisms. And when I see this stuff and I hear I learn about this history, it's like, OK, I got to like I actually got to like take a break and like breathe and like, yeah, you know, not to mention the, the humanity of all of it. Oh, the humanity. Right. Um, so it can it can get kind of dark. And so it takes, you know, it takes a certain. Um you know, grounding and a and a and a and a, um, a willingness to go there and to look squarely at, you know, what 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 can often um, come uh, open up as a very dark past. Yeah, like we went through something really dark, and if you look now and you just you know, it's like, well, what do we do with all this information? It's like, well, you look at our the you know, the compounding nature of our problems in this country. And it just really does feel like we're, you know, under some kind of a spell, but we yep. just, can't, we can't get it together. No. And, 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 and the mechanisms in place aren't allowing us to get together. That's it. Right? They, anytime you get a, you get a groundswell going, it gets infiltrated 
Um, so it, it's, it's one just of those like this research. There's just this research community all of a sudden in the last six months has been like cats and dogs. It's like, oh, yeah, yeah, no, yeah. it's not. We did it ourselves. It's like, take a deep breath. It's yeah, a lot. And that's what you have in. to do. You have to understand that. Listen, if we were so far off that we were just talking nonsense, there would be no need for division. They would just let us play. They would let us keep spouting off and saying what we're saying. But the fact that we have done our research and we're bringing facts to the table now that, you know, we have a case to present. Now, do we have all the answers? No, but we have a justifiable case with val a valid argument here. That's when the division is going to come in because they see, oh, shit, like you mentioned before about – um the devil in the white city. Well, yeah, they kind of, there's that groundswell. You hear Chicago world fair in the ether now, and they have to address it. They feel like, okay, well, there's a, th th there's too much chatter about this out there. We have to silence it with our response. And here's our answer. Uh, here's a diversion. Here's some yep. smoke and mirrors, you know, Right. It kind of does. It kind of does indicate that you're onto something, that you're over the target. But we do. I think we really do have to be careful not to get caught up in this sort of binary divisions. Like, and for me, looking at it as you know, somebody with a fair amount of building experience and you know, architectural experience, it's like I look at the stones. I look at the buildings. The stones don't lie. Like I got into this. I got into this old world architecture in America. Um, uh, uh, field of research because I started looking at megalithic structures mm -hmm. from antiquity mm -hmm. and looking at what they're doing down in, you know, Cusco and Peru and in Egypt. And, you know, you, 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 and it's like the, the whole Graham Hancock thing. It's like the, you know, it keeps, things keep getting older in the farther back you look, the layers that are on the bottom of these these megalithic buildings those are the ones that are most sophisticated the most impossible to explain with the stones that are too big to have moved from this quarry 100 miles away let alone yep. carved into this mind-bending precision and stacked upon each other you know and so that's what kind of led me into this where i just kept peeling back you know one realizing that the ancients had some kind of technology that we don't understand now and that's a humbling, you know, it's a humbling place to arrive. It's not, it's like, no, it's no longer the linear progression of history. You know, history, like Plato said, goes, comes and goes in cycles. You know, yes. so we're on the wheel of time. And, and, and that's a tough pill for many to swallow because what have they been told their, their whole life? That you are the most evolved, that you are the smartest. We are the most technologically advanced we've ever been, which as you know, you or I or people that are researching tend to find that not to be the truth because there's no way that they could have done the things that they did with what they we've been told they had. So they had to, there has to, there is a mystery out there. There is a magic element out there that's missing to this equation. Yeah. And, and we've got, I think the greatest mystery of them all. And it's like right around us hidden in plain sight. Yep. Yep. Oh, Matthew, I could talk to you for days, my friend. Uh, we do. Is there anything you want to get out there to anyone before we uh, sign off here? Well, um, should I pitch my website or? Yeah, whatever you want. Plug away. Cool. All right. Um, yeah, my my design work, my architectural work is at dreamdesignbuild.org, uh, O-R-G. Uh, I just launched a, uh, a website for my, um, you know, more personal projects, you know, backyard chicken coop and tiny house buildings and, you know, starting to write some thoughts and put some videos together. Um, so that's at MatthewRSmith.art, A-R-T. And uh, that's just getting off the ground. And then I've got an Instagram site for my, um, my architectural work, and that's at Yurt Designs. Excellent. Yeah. Well, this, Matt, thank you. I, I got to say, this has been probably my favorite conversation I've had on this show. And uh, like I said, I could talk to you for days and we will definitely be touching base again because uh, our paths are crossing, our research is lining up and 
there's not many people that I can have conversations like this with and, and leave. Like I have a list here of probably like four books I want to read now. I got like three other topics I want to dig into. So thank you. Uh, this, this was just a great conversation here. I re I really enjoyed it. Fantastic. The honor is mine, Matt. Um, you know, I really appreciate it. I, I really enjoyed it and I'm looking forward to doing it again for sure. Excellent. Well, thank you very much, my friend. We will, uh, we will definitely have to do this again. To everyone else, uh, stay strong and question everything.